I think that the moment you enter the studio, your agenda and your focus has to be very singular. And that is that you are serving the record and the, the songs, the artist, and the process of getting the best out of everybody who is in the studio with you, all the musicians and, and of course, the, the, the artists. In order to do that properly, you have to kind of block out everything else, I find. And that's not an absolute where it's a crime to be looking at your phone or to be, you know, you're having your mind wander for, for a moment or think about this or that. But overall, at least for me, I find that, that, that it's quite important to always be focused on what's happening between the musicians, what's happening with the artist and, and the feeling in the room and where the music is going and, and, and guiding it towards where it needs to be. And sometimes it can be a very angular thing to think of in, in that it can sometimes come down to something very silly, like in a moment of tension, just saying something that is a bit absurd that, that sort of breaks the mood of things and and if someone is very nervous and tense it, it can just throw things up in the air for just a second enough to have a reset happen it's quite important also and this in conjunction with this track i had two incredibly strong-willed and very really um, strongly intuitive women that I was working with on this song. I had Nora Jones, who's of course, you know, such a amazing artist and great singer. And really at this point in, in her career has such a great sense of where she's going and where things should go musically. I had Candace, who despite being at a very early juncture in her career is quite intuitive as well, a strong intuitive. And a big part of what I needed to do in this situation was keep my mouth shut and just watch. And at certain moments, I would nudge things a little bit this way or a little bit that way. I, but I listened quite a bit. And I think that it would have been quite easy for me to interfere with the vibe, the chemistry of what was happening if I had exerted more um, obvious direction into the process. And instead of doing that, I let Nora kind of guide things a little bit, which made Candace quite happy because Nora's her hero. So I let her do my job to a large degree. And then at certain mo moments, for example, like on the structuring the intro, she was working it out and she tried this kind of, I call it the Wind Cries Mary. That little... which is like Hendrix's way that he dealt with the intro and on The Wind Cries Mary. When she played that, she played that once and she it was kind of a mistake or something she was just fiddling with. And I said, ooh, that's really nice. I went from not saying anything, letting her guide things. I just exerted a little bit of positive push on, on that little thing. And then to a large degree, in a lot of ways, I just let things happen on this and and between the two of them they really figured out how the vocal should go back and forth as far as being a duet and it would be easy to go to a place as the producer to think well i'm going to show her but i what i know i'm going to exert some influence here it would be quite easy to ruin things by doing that getting to a place in yourself where you realize saying nothing or saying very little can sometimes be the best way to produce in, in situations, I think is, is really an important idea for people, especially if they're early on in producing records. It's easy to, to get caught up in this kind of, I think of it almost like spiritual materialism of, of a sort, where you're thinking, well, you know, I gotta produce here, I gotta do, I gotta, you know, I, I'm, I, I gotta tell them what to do. And a lot of times, the best thing that you can do is not say, tell them what to do and let things just kind of drift for a while until a solution starts appearing to the people involved and then reinforce what starts coming out of nothing. 
you know if you have a question mark for a s section how you're going to transition from one section to another don't work it out for them let let them just play it a few times and then when they happen onto the solution identify it for them and say hey th that thing that you just played that's how you're going to join those two sections together that w works beautifully and by this you are able to do a number of things. You're able to make them feel more invested in what's going on, which means they're gonna put more of their soul into what they're playing if they're that invested and feel like they are really contributing to the architecture of this thing. The artist is gonna feel much stronger if you're not stepping in at each juncture and saying, here's how you solve that problem, here's how you solve this problem. And at the beginning of when I started producing records, I was guilty of doing this quite a bit, and I had, to, I had to learn to not focus on the problem, focus on the spirit of what's going on, and keeping that spirit high, just gently keeping things on track, nudge, a nudge here this way, a little bit that way. When you're dealing with musicians rather than a through composed track that's sequenced, you really have to stay conscious of bolstering their sense of creativity. A lot of people discount, you know, uh, I think a lot of people just think, well, we've got a job to do, we've got to finish by this time, and, you know, I know how to do this thing, so I'm just going to tell everybody what to play. And you can do that if you're making a record that is feel-based, that, that, that is a, a record that has to breathe and kind of have this sort of interactive liquidity to it like this record was you really need to keep your center and be conscious once you enter the studio of almost nothing but the music and sort of the souls of the people that you're working with how to elevate them how to set the stage for them to do the best possible playing and work that they could possibly can do and maybe even better than that once we started kind of just playing around with it very loosely in the studio. A lot of it just came together right away. What Clarence, the drummer, was, was doing, he just fell right into the right thing because he just has a great sense of intuition. And, and Nora, of course, in her playing, is she lays into what the vibe is that she's thinking of. If she was going to play acoustic piano, which I definitely wanted her to do, I mean, I wasn't going to dictate that to her, but but I almost steered her to the to the acoustic piano because I wanted her to play. She kind of said, "Well, what should I play? Should I play Wurlitzer or should I play acoustic piano?" I don't remember exactly how, but I kind of reinforced the idea of her playing acoustic piano because she's a distinctive acoustic piano player. Not that I mean, she sounds great when she's playing Rhodes or Wurlitzer too, but I find that Candace has more personality on Wurlitzer or Rhodes, and Nora is just imposing acoustic piano. So when she started playing the song, everybody kind of fell in line. I, and there was very little for me to say to the drummer, Clarence, or to Scott, the bass player, because they, all of those years of experience and probably knowing Nora's music, knowing records that I have made, knowing all of these different parts of the puzzle, I didn't have to say really anything to them, and, and Candace just completely flowed right into what, was, what Nora was doing. So it was very fluid, and what we did was we just rehearsed it a little bit, and not even in a, in a concerted, eff effortful way. It was very much just like, oh, and then we can do this, boom, you know, like in roughing through the changes and you know, making sure that everybody was playing the same transitions harmonically and whatnot. So by the time we, it, it came time to do a take, all of the basic considerations had been somewhat worked out. But in a way, and this, is, this happens quite often, things were still fluid enough that there was just a little bit of tension there that kept people hadn't locked into a part on, on different portions of the song. That kind of a little bit of uncertainty is often the best thing about a first take because players haven't worked it out per se in their mind. And so there's a little bit of that unconscious feeling 
to it. And what that looks like from the outside as a producer, when if you're watching people, watching players. And I know this also from the years of me playing on records and being in the position of the musician uh, on the date. You look at the people and sometimes their eyes kind of go back in their head and their mouth, their jaws drop down and they're kind of a little bit, they're not quite all there. And the reason for that is that they're just, they're flying on intuition. That's what keeps the music in this sort of liquid state that's not settled and not preordained. And that's where you really get the magical part of a room full, full of musicians playing together rather than something that you've uh, put together by sequencing or by, you know, by sending around the world and getting people to virtually put parts on uh, in their own place or whatnot. That kind of dynamic happens when people are in a room together. They haven't worked out all of the kinks. They haven't worked out all the wrinkles. So, you know, there's a little bit of, of fear, <laughs> maybe a good kind of fear that is part of the situation.